Hi everyone. Hey. So, um, hands up how many of you came here because of the word sex? <laughs> At least you're honest, right? Okay, so, um, sorry I'm about to disappoint those of you who came here because of that word, because I'm actually not going to talk about sex. Yeah, that was just like a year to two years, you guys um, what I'm going to talk about is agent-based modeling using Ruby. Okay, um, anyone here uses Ruby? Wow, why is it everyone on the left uses Ruby and no one on the right? Okay, one guy. Okay. So let me just start off very quickly about myself. Uh, I'm from PayPal, as uh, introduced. And uh, I've been in PayPal about a year. Oh, there's a big screen here as well. So, previously I was on HP. I ran a group called HP Labs, uh, which does cloud computing research, so a lot of research stuff. And this, in part, has to do something with research as well. So, you can guess from the, the work I've been doing. As you probably know, I love Ruby. Ruby is my primary programming language. I've been using Ruby for a long time. Uh, not as long as I've been using some other programming languages, but uh, it's scary kind of how long I've been using it already, right? Yeah. And it's kind of scary how much I love it still. I like it so much that I've actually written three books, so this is one of them, this is the other one. And the last one I wrote was uh, Exploring Everything, the Everyday Things with Ruby and R, and I did not just finish writing it actually. Uh, I finished writing it two years ago. Um, it has been since translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Like all Asian languages, I don't know why, but somehow they, they appear here. Yeah. So, let me just start with the topic straight away. Um, Any one of you know what this is? Any, anyone? Oh, okay. So just give a little bit of tips here. Now you see it moving. Sounds, looks familiar? No, looks scary? <laughs> so it's actually this guy, right? So um, this is a common styling. We don't have common stylings here in Singapore, but uh, there are a lot of common stylings, I think, in other parts of the world, in Europe, I think. Uh, that was a picture of about close to a million starlings in over a Danish skyline. Somebody took a picture of that. I mean, it's quite amazing. So that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about how you can simulate something like that, what you just saw, using an algorithm called Voids. Voids was originally created um, by a computer scientist called Craig Reynolds for uh, what was that? Graphic simulation. Essentially, what he did was he modeled animal motions, right? And uh, he modeled the animal motions using three simple rules. And uh, those three simple rules resulted in this kind of fucking behavior. I will go through a little bit of that and I'll also show some code if you're interested. So, uh, normally I wouldn't show code in this because it takes a bit long, but I have 45 minutes and I think it will spill, spill over. So, if you're interested, I can also show code. Um, essentially, what causes all of these things is something called emergence. It's about complex behavior arising from simple rules. And some of the, the algorithms that have been shown here eventually became the basis for some really exciting and, and impressive cinema animations. Uh, this list is kind of old, but uh, a lot of the newer stuff that's been come up. So we are going to see Hobbits, um, we have seen Hobbits and you're going to see the new one coming up soon. A lot of the animation actually comes from the algorithm. Of course, it has since then become a lot more complicated. It's not just uh, pre-rules. But yeah, the basis of uh, what you see there are, are basically this. But beyond what uh, I talked about here just now about flocking, I'm also going to talk about agent-based modeling. Um, it's essentially a autonomous, about autonomous agents interacting with each other and the environment. It's used in many many, many commercial instances like uh, analyzing supply chain optimization, 
uh, doing acute spread of epidemics like uh, Ebola. Right? Um, heavily influenced by the game of life, but this particular one that I'm going to show you is influenced by Epstein and Excel sugar scale simulations. So um, my assumption here, I'm not sure whether it's correct or not, is that most of the people here are either computer engineering or computer science, right? Anyone here not from computer engineering or computer science? Just two, that's fine. Great, so what I'm gonna do and uh, the steps I'm gonna go through is to build a, an artificial world called Utopia. Um, it's populated by something I call ROIDs. Um, ROIDs are essentially implementation of points using Ruby. Uh, these ROIs are free to wander through an infinite landscape and they are created using Ruby, pure Ruby, and a library called Gosu. Right? So Gosu is actually um, not a simulation library, Gosu is actually a gaming, 2D gaming library in Ruby. It's actually pretty good. Um, in a previous iteration, so this is not the first time I've done this, obviously, right? So in the previous iterations, I actually used Java, uh, JRuby, and then I also used Ruby with uh, shoes. But I think this iteration is probably the best. I uh, use Gosu, it's very smooth. Okay, let me show you the base simulation. So, time to see some examples. So, this is what I have. Is it okay? Yeah. So essentially, this is uh, the base simulation. This is what, yeah. And I'll show you. So you see, there's a count counter here because otherwise it will run indefinitely. What happens now is if it runs down from 2000 to zero, it will just shut down on its own. Uh, let me just quickly show you some code here. So this is Utopia using Gosu. This is Ruby creating the world and so on and so forth. Right. So this is the representation of the Roy. Quickly, yeah. So the three rules that um, was created by uh, Craig Reynolds talks about separation, alignment, and coherence. Yeah. So these are the three rules. Okay. Let's get back into the slides. So that was the base simulation, meaning that on that basis, I'm going to model and uh, simulate the rest of what I'm, I'm going to talk about. So first thing is money. Okay, so um, the idea of 1% should not, live, should not live at the expense of other 99% of the people, the occupying movement, I think that's been on the top of mind for a lot of people. Um, essentially, it's about uh, separation within the, the haves and have nots, right? The rich and uh, the poor, right? So we have um, cases where certain people actually have a lot more money than others and uh, the percentage of the people who have so much more money than the rest is so small versus the rest that it's kind of scary. So what I'm trying to do here is to try to simulate income inequality. Why does income inequality exist? Is it natural or is it because of some conspiracy that some big wigs have actually tried to impose on us? So using the same simulation, what I do now is I make some changes. Previously, the ROIs are immortal, they wouldn't die, right? And they will live on forever. Uh, right to, to do this simulation, what I do is I impose a, an energy level, right? So this is a randomly assigned energy level that's from, zero, uh, from 1 to 100. And then everything, they will lose energy, meaning that every second of their lives, they will lose energy. And when it reaches uh, zero, it will die, right? If it doesn't want to die, what it will do, it will actively seek out food and consume it. Consuming food will replenish the energy level and you will continue uh, living, right? Uh, I will also randomly generate food such that you can consume. Of course, the roids are still immortal, it still wouldn't die. So as long as it continues consuming food, it will continue living. To analyze the, the whole process, what I do is I collect data and everything, and I'll do this until the end of the world, like uh, when the simulation completes. So let me show you the, the first simulation. Okay, so you see the red 
The red is the, uh, the rice, as you saw just now. The green, the blocks are the food. So it, um, you know, this is what happens. And as you can see, okay, the number of rice reduces a lot over time, right? So yeah, just to show you the, the simulation. What are the results? So you see at t equals zero, the initial creation of the, of the world, utopia, you have quite a decent distribution, right? I wouldn't exactly say normal because it's only 100. Um, so the distribution is quite even. But at the end of the simulation, at the end of the world, what you see is very skewed, like something's very skewed to the one end um, of the whole scale. It doesn't show up too well, so let me blow up a little bit. So at the day of reckoning, at the end of the simulation, what do you see? Uh, T equals 1999. What happens is most rice are dead. Yeah. Uh, zero, zero energy level. And there are a few rice that has a lot of energy. Why do you think that happened? Any guesses? Anything? No? Okay, anyway, so let me just continue. Um, to actually measure the uh, inequality, um, I use Gini coefficient. So anyone here knows what a Gini coefficient is? That's good. Okay, so um, for those who don't know, Gini coefficient is a measurement of inequality. Yeah of a distribution, like and zero is perfect equality, everything is equal, and one is perfect inequality, it's, it's totally skewed. Right? Um, to visually define what it is, we use the Lorentz curve. So let's do the same set of data, but using Lorentz curve. Right? So at t equals zero, you see there is inequality, of course it's, it's random, um, but not as much, but t equals 1999 gets a lot of inequality. Okay. Any takers, any kind of uh, guesses why this happens? Guessing compound interest. Compound interest? Yeah, the same thing. Okay. Anyone else? Wow, this is really a quiet bunch. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the observation is that over a period of time, a small percentage of the population gets a large percentage of the energy, right? So um, why does it happen? Um, is it because of hard work and inherent talent and ability? The, the answer is, of course, no, because uh, all roids are the same, right? Um, is it because some roids are luckier because, you know, what they, they start off with better, they have higher energy levels, right? Because it's random. So maybe some roids start off with 100, and some roids are with one. So you, you get one that tough luck that you die earlier. But that's not necessarily true either because if it's random and it has a normal distribution, then at the end of the day, it should also have a normal distribution. And that didn't happen. So it's really all back to where we started, um, emergence. And what you said is true just now. It's a little bit like compound interest. The small changes ripple down to very large effects over a period of time, very large and drastic effects over time. And the simple local rules bring complex global changes. Okay. Sometimes global changes we, we don't really anticipate. Okay, so um, still not much on your, your audience, but never mind, let me get to sex. Maybe that will wake you guys up. So next. Um, now, we change the uh, uh, simulation a bit. Now the roids have gender. There's male roids and there are female roids. The male roids are blue, the female roids are red. And the under age ones uh, can't sleep properly, but they are white. Okay? So if the female is within a childbearing age of 25 to 50, uh, so bear with me, uh, and if it has enough energy, it will look for a nearby male. And the male it encounters is also within childbearing age and has enough energy to procreate and create a baby roid. Right? Um, and you procreate, you lose energy, and so on and so forth. The second thing I added in is death, right? So you have birth, you will have death. And each roid has a randomly assigned lifespan, right? 
Um, remember previous, the, the previous simulation, as long as you have enough energy, you will never die. But in this particular simulation, if you reach your assigned lifespan, right, the Grim Reaper will appear and you're dead. Okay? Um, no matter how much energy you have. And the data collection, we want to investigate the uh, population changes over time. Um, and every tick, we collect the population of the entire world and of the population of males and females. Okay, so let's look at the simulation. Please do not laugh as I type this. <coughs> right, so you see the white roids. Okay, they turn blue or, or red, right? And then it goes after the food. It increase the population, and then increase population, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me just shut this down, get back to the slide. How do you think the graph will look like? Same? Okay. So, obviously you get up and down, right? So, the initial start of it, you have a certain population. Population increases over time, because you have food, and you procreate, you, you give birth to more children. And then lifespan kicks in, and the older ones die, right? And the population goes down. And then after that, the, the younger ones, they come to childbearing age, they procreate, they create new ones, and population increases, and comes down, and increases, and comes down, right? It's quite stable until the end of the simulation. Now, I next, what I do is I made a minor change, right? And then uh, I ran the same simulation again. Something happens here, and this spot right here. And this spot is not the end of the simulation yet. What do you think happened here? I mean, from the chart, what do you think happened? Good tries. Yeah, so this happened, right? Uh, the total web came and destroyed everything. No, no it's, it's extinction, right? So um, basically, the entire population of roids died. Right, the last male and female maybe don't have enough energy and they die, or maybe there were a few males left and no more females and the population became extinct. Right? In the end, whatever it is, everything died. So, the next question is, what did I change? What do you think I changed? What do you think I changed that's so cataclysmic that uh, it totally wiped out the population of the roids? Two child policy. Two child policy. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Mr. Here? Mm -hmm. Anyway, you can leave that for the minister later. We're still talking about science here. You know? uh, any, any guesses? Is that? Okay. Um, anything else? Amount of food. Amount of food? Okay. The roids can start killing each other. So it, it evolves and starts eating each other and therefore it, uh, cannibalism happens. It's good. Yes? Amount of energy needed to produce the next generation. Amount of energy to produce next generation, yeah. Anything else? They don't lose energy after they procreate, then they should survive, right? Mm. Selection of a uh, boy or a girl? Selection of a boy or a girl? Good. I mean... Make the money more. Just like the previous one, make the money more. Oh, make more money? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. That's, those are actually very creative things, and maybe I should actually try those simulations. Unfortunately, that's, none of it is actually true, right? So what I actually did was I only changed childbearing age from between 25 to 50 uh, to between 30 to 50, right? That's pretty mundane, right? Uh, so, and does it happen all the time? Is this something that's very consistent? Uh, the answer is no. Four or five times this happened, but one time it didn't and actually lasted through the end of the simulation. So what does it tell? It's like, okay, you have a lousy simulation, right? So, so what I'm trying to show here, yes? Isn't the issue here, Justin? Total energy allows to the system isn't enough to sustain a viable breeding population. 
Uh, yeah, so there is not enough energy in the uh, in the system, or rather, there's not enough energy, and uh, the, no the, the amount of new energy you're creating per cycle. Yeah, it's not enough energy. Not enough to sustain a viable population. That's right. It's just a collapse. That's right. That's right. Many other constraints. So um, Energy, yeah, so the, the level of energy is also random initially because I randomly assign the amount of energy per oil. But uh, so the, the energy they're consuming, right. boxes, is those are being constantly refilled, right? Yes, they're constantly being refilled. So for the system to be stable, <coughs> the minimum energy condition mm -hmm. would be enough that there's enough energy being replenished to sustain a minimum viable breed population, which in nature is anything from 30 to 30,000 tons. Depending on the species that That's true. So, so surely that's that's enough to, to describe what's happening. But you have to have energy in the system to sustain the breeding population. Um, that's true too. That's true too. Um, but um, that's not really what happened in this case. Well, you, you, raised, you pushed back the reproduction age, which doubles the energy requirement for a breeding population. Yes, but uh, it's not consistent, right? So it doesn't happen all the time. So I ran this through, if I ran this 100 times, I don't know, do not know how many times it will happen. I ran this through five times and at least four times it actually happened, extinction actually happened, but one time it actually didn't. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it is random in a way, um, but in other ways it might not be random. So what, what I was trying to show, show here, and I think you could probably try to run this on your own as well because uh, all the code here can actually run GitHub, right. um, is that the simulations actually mirror a lot of the things that are around us that we see today, like financial crashes, um, social unrest, animal extinctions. Some some animals become extinct through different reasons, even climate changes. Right? That it doesn't always need to be something that's very big and becomes external, like cannibalism or, uh, or something very radical, the amount of energy changes or whatever. Um, it can be something that's really small that we don't really notice or we don't really realize and that could trigger something that's of uh, epic crisis, right? like extinction. So um, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that things are not often as stable as we like to think it is, right? or unrelated. Because you, could, you might think that changing the childbearing age from 25 to 30, so what? Right? It's, it's a small matter. But in the end, it turned out to be it is not a small matter. So what I was trying to, to say here, and of course, uh, you can disagree with me, you can actually run your own simulations. As I said earlier, uh, the code is on GitHub. You can go and check it out and, and run it yourself. Things are not as stable as, as you might see. Right? So moving on, um, evolution, or rather what I was trying to show here is natural selection. So. Uh, I suppose most people here in this audience will understand what natural selection is, the survival of the fittest. Um, about organisms with more suitable attributes likely to reproduce and pass attributes to the next generation, and therefore over time the attributes become more prominent. Okay. So what I'm trying to show here, I'm trying to simulate natural selection. Is natural selection, does natural selection happen or just like a uh, uh, fiction of somebody's imagination, particularly this guy? Right? So, um, changes are made in utopia. So previously all the uh, all rights have the same attributes and the only difference is the maximum lifespan and an energy level. In this simulation, I added on two attributes. One is the metabolism, the other one is the vision range. Metabolism is how well the roids convert food into energy. And vision range is because as it goes round, it needs to actually see, detect the food before it can consume, go there and consume it. So the vision range uh, talks about how well the, the roid can actually see the food, how far it can see the food. Right? Um, and the roid babies inherit these two attributes from the parent. How does it inherit? We use uh, very simple Mendelian rules for the crossover. So we have assumption that the father has a genotype of small m and small e, and the mother has a genotype of big m and big e. So the possible genotypes of the baby are small m, small v, small m, big v, big m, small v, and big m, big v. Then, of course, in the end, I just randomly pick one of the four. It is overly simplistic, right? but uh, this is again a simulation. Okay, the, the data collection, I want to see the changes for the uh, metabolism and vision range of the population over time. So what I do is I calculate the average metabolism and vision range of all rods that are still alive at every tick. So every tick, I collect the 
metabolism and vision range of every roid that's still alive, and then I get the average, right? And then I plot a set of data. We show the simulation. Evolution. The same thing, right? I followed from before, and it runs. And to be honest, after you've seen the first two simulations, this is not really exciting anymore because it's almost the same. Right? Let me just get back into the slides then and uh, see what happened. So this is actually natural selection in action. Right? Metabolism improves over time. So it starts out with the average metabolism improves over time. And this is the metabolism of the population that's still alive, right? I don't actually measure the ones that are, that are dead anymore. So you can see that the metabolism of the roids are better over time. And the same thing with the reason range. But the thing that's not so obvious is that natural selection is, it doesn't actually just jump up, right? It's not a linear line. It actually goes down a little bit here. Let me try to find the arrow, okay? Oh. Okay, you see it. Okay, here, this part here, right? It's not a straight line, and it actually goes down a little bit before it goes up again. But of course, eventually it plateaus. Okay. Now, one more thing. Why do you think there is a plateau of straight line towards the end? Sorry. Everyone the same number. Anything else? Absolutely right. So this is a simulation. There is no genetic mutation. There is no nothing, right? So over time, you once you reach a plateau, you're there. You're stuck there forever. Right? Since the simulation is not real life, so I'll say is, these are all simulations. Right? Um, what you just see: natural selection, better attributes, uh, survive longer, reproduce with similar attributes. And for those who have actually seen this presentation before in the past, I added something else, one more thing. Um, so I want to talk about inheritance. Okay, so what I want to say is uh, when a simulation, the roids die for old age, and then even if it has the most energy of all, it's like the richest man in, in, the, in the, the whole utopia, the energy will just dissipate. But what happens if you take the collected energy of the roids, and then you pass it on to the children. Right? So what I'm trying to simulate here is wealth gathered by the parents, being inherited by the children. What I'm trying to ask is, is this a good thing? Is passing down your wealth to the children a good thing? Okay, so I won't show this anymore because like I said it's really boring after a few simulations. Um, so the only difference here is that I, when a roid die, I will collect the energy that he has and distribute it to all the children, all the surviving children. Um, and then I will compare the simulation previously that I ran for evolution with the inheritance. Okay, oops, maybe I shouldn't show this, but yeah. Yeah, so um, I ran it again, and this is what I see, right? Um, metabolism and vision range. With inheritance, set natural selection, it does get there in the end, sort of, right? but uh, it takes a little bit of time. Um, and from the simulation, you see that somehow inheritance seems to stunt evolutionary advances. Right? So at least from the simulation, passing down your wealth to your children doesn't seem to be such a great thing after all. <laughs> yes? Um, did you simulate inheritance not uniformly across children, but to the eldest of <coughs> son? No, it was distributed really. Okay. Yeah, I just it's easier to do actually. So that's what I did. Right? I take something. I take all the energy I divide by the number of surviving children, and I give one, every one of them. So the wealth dies after the generation means more than supply. You know? So that is actually a an exercise for the audience. <laughs> take the code, run the simulation, and let me know. Um. That's more or less my presentation. Just to recap, we start off with the base, with a just simple uh, roid sim simulation, right? Just uh, roids running around forever. Then we talk about money. 
then we talk about sex, then we talk about evolution, and we talk about inheritance. So, um, as a final caution, I want to say that what I did just now was purely simulation. It's not equal to real life. Um, but it's always good to isolate certain factors, and you want to, this is a scientific matter, right? You want to isolate certain things that you want to investigate and just go deeper into it. And of course, the uh, conclusions, as with many things, are often open for interpretation. What I said earlier on was just my interpretation. Um, but what I really want to get at in the end is that uh, you can always use programming as tools to explore the world around you. Um, I'm going to stand on the soapbox, there's no soapbox here, but I'm going to stand on it anyway. Uh, very often, those of us here who are professional programmers, we use tools to write stuff for business. Uh, we enable the businesses, we generate the uh, business value, revenue for businesses. What I'm saying is that you can use the same skills, same tools, also for other things like, for example, exploring the world around you. Okay, so thank you. Um, for those who are interested, let's, you can get the post on here, github.com, and uh, you can reach out to me with an email and uh, my Twitter handle. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, mic's not working. Oh. It's on. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Really? You can come, always come in and ask me questions. Yeah. Worst case, you can always like, ask them somewhere. He's got to be around. For I'm going to be around for a while. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Stefan.